Oh, it's unspeakable to you? What her father did to your family, that was unspeakable. What Rhaegar Targaryen did to your sister, the woman I loved. I'll kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. You can't get your hands on this one, can you? What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back for another Game of Thrones slash A Song of Ice and Fire video. Thanks to Game of Thrones, one of the biggest theories was confirmed last season. We found out that Rhaegar and Lyanna were actually married, which makes Jon Snow the true heir to the Seven Kingdoms. This is something most of us fans already saw coming because this has been a very popular theory for a very long time. The clues were hidden very well, but once you pick up on the scent, the clues become a lot easier to see. So today I want to show you some of the clues from the books, and I'm pretty sure all of the ones you will see today were not provided in the show. I won't bother talking about the tourney of Harrenhal or the Tower of Joy because everyone should have heard enough about that in the television show by now. I will admit that most of these clues or hints are very subjective. Some of you may see these as reaching, while others may not. But I wanted to mainly make this video for people that have not read the books because you may not realize that George R.R. Martin was hinting at Jon Snow being a king for a very long time. I know some people still believe Jon Snow is a bastard or he is not the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna, but I really don't want to get into that today. I just want to show you the things that I think point to Jon being the legitimate son of Rhaegar Targaryen, making him the king of Westeros. The first thing I want to show you is on the very first page of Jon's very first chapter in A Game of Thrones. The reason why I want to show you this one first is because this one is the easiest to disregard. It's just one word that doesn't really prove anything. But I thought it was a very interesting word to use in John's very first page. Now that I know George R.R. R. Martin is a master at leaving breadcrumbs, I wouldn't put it past him to leave hints at the very beginning of the story. This is what John's very first chapter says. A singer was playing the high harp and reciting a ballad, but down at this end of the hall his voice could scarcely be heard above the roar of the fire, the clangor of the pewter plates and cups, and the low mutter of a hundred drunken conversations. The reason why this stuck out to me was because it immediately reminded me of Rhaegar Targaryen. We don't know much about this man, but we do know that he loves to sing and play his harp. His singing was so beautiful it actually made Lyanna cry. So as I was reading the books again, this really stuck out to me because I thought it was interesting that George decided to talk about someone singing and playing the harp on Jon's first page. Now this might not be anything at all, but I couldn't ignore it. This next one is from Eddard Stark's very first chapter of the first book. This is when he's talking to Robert Baratheon as they are heading to Lyanna's statue. Ned Stark says, Kings are a rare sight in the north. Robert snorts and says, More likely they were hiding under the snow. Snow, Ned. Now if you believe the theory that Jon is the legitimate son of Rhaegar Targaryen, then you could say Jon is a king in hiding, under the bastard name Snow. The true king was hiding in Winterfell all along by Ned Stark, and he kept him hidden by giving him the name Snow and saying he was his bastard son. There is something else I want to point out in Jon's first chapter. As Jon was talking to his uncle Benjen about joining the Night's Watch, Benjen was trying to tell Jon that he was still too young to join. He really didn't want Jon to throw away other opportunities he may have in his life, but Jon was very adamant about leaving Winterfell and taking the Black, so Jon tells Benjen this. Daron Targaryen was only 14 when he conquered Dorne. The young dragon was one of his heroes. This doesn't really prove much either, but I thought it was interesting that George was planting these seeds of a Targaryen connection very early in Jon's chapters. The young dragon was one of Jon's heroes, and Jon may be a young dragon himself. Benjen also tells Jon that the young dragon died by the age of 18, which is very close to the same age that Jon died. Now let's move on to Tyrion's second chapter in A Game of Thrones. This quote is said while Jon and Tyrion are traveling to the Wall together. They set up camp for the night and Jon notices Tyrion is reading a book, and Tyrion tells Jon that he's reading a book about dragons. Tyrion says, when I was your age, I used to dream of having a dragon of my own. Then Tyrion says, don't look at me that way, bastard. I know your secret. You've dreamt the same kind of dreams. We never hear about Jon having any dreams about dragons, but sometimes I feel like this is George trying to speak directly to us. In Jon's fourth chapter, he's at the wall and he's having a conversation with Samuel Tarly. 
This is when Sam tells John about his father and how he forced him to join the Night's Watch. But in the books, John tells Sam about his dream where he's wandering around the crypts of Winterfell, and this is what he says. The old kings of winter are down there sitting on their thrones with stone wolves at their feet and iron swords across their laps, but it's not them I'm afraid of. I scream that I'm not a Stark, that this isn't my place, but it's no good. I have to go anyway, so I start down, feeling the walls as I descend. With no torch to light the way, it gets darker and darker until I want to scream. Now you could say the reason why John feels like he doesn't belong down there is because he's a bastard, and he knows he will never have a spot of his own down in the crypts. But if you believe in the theory, then you know it's much more than this. John does have Stark blood, but he knows he's not a Stark, and we know he's a Targaryen. That's really why this isn't his place. Now this next one has some really great wordplay in it. This is when Arya is staying at King's Landing, and she's training with Sirio Pharrell. He has Arya chasing cats all over the Red Keep, and Arya runs into one of the gold cloaks as she's chasing them. One by one, Arya had chased them down and snatched them up and brought them proudly to Sirio Pharrell. All of them but this one. This one-eared black devil of a tomcat. That's the real king of this castle right there, one of the gold cloaks had told her. Older than sin and twice as mean. One time, the king was feasting the queen's father, and that black bastard hopped up on the table and snatched a roast quail right out of Lord Tywin's fingers. There are two key phrases in this quote. The first one is where the gold cloak says that's the real king of this castle right there. Then he refers to the cat as a black bastard. Now which character in this story could be considered a black bastard who just might be the actual king of the castle? There are at least four different times in the books that John is called a black bastard. For one, he is a bastard because that's what we're told at first. And John joins the Night's Watch, which means he wears all black. John took the black, making him a black bastard. He is the true king of the castle in King's Landing. This was hidden very well, but if you're paying attention to what George is doing here, then it kind of sticks out during a second or third reading. Let's move on to one of Eddard's chapters. In the TV show, this is when Littlefinger takes Ned to see the last person John Aaron spoke with before he died. It's the mother of one of King Robert's bastards, and Ned meets with her in Littlefinger's brothel. Ned is realizing that all of Robert's bastards have black hair, unlike his kids with Cersei. In the books, this happens a little differently because we get to go inside Ned Stark's head and hear what he's thinking. When Ned meets with one of Robert's mistresses, she says, Tell him that when you see him, my lord, as it, as it please you, tell him how beautiful she is. Ned says I will. Ned had promised her, and he thought of the promises he'd made Lyanna as she lay dying, and the price that he paid to keep them. I will tell him, child, and I promise you, Bara shall not go wanting. She had smiled then, a smile so tremulous and sweet that it cut the heart right out of him. Right after Ned leaves, he's riding through the rainy night, and he sees Jon Snow's face right in front of him. Now why would Ned be picturing Jon Snow right after he started to think about the promise he made to Lyanna? Could it be because Ned promised to keep Jon safe, just like Ned was trying to do with Robert's bastards? But the next thing Ned thinks about makes this even more interesting. After he thinks about Lyanna's promise and he sees Jon's face, Ned immediately starts to remember Rhaegar Targaryen. He wondered if Rhaegar had frequented brothels, but he thought not. So as you can see, as soon as Ned starts to think about Lyanna, he pictures Jon Snow's face. Then he starts to think about Rhaegar for the first time in years. It was Lyanna and Jon that made Ned think about Rhaegar for the first time in years. This secret is eating Ned Stark alive, but he knows it was the right thing to do or else Jon would be dead. This next one really feels like George is trying to tell us something. In the second book, A Clash of Kings, John is having a conversation with Lord Commander Mormont, and the Lord Commander is telling John about Maester Eamon's life, and some of the history of the most recent Targaryen kings. Mormont tells John about Maester Eamon's father, his brothers, and the Mad King. Then he says, Jaime Lannister put an end to the line of the Dragon Kings, when he killed the Mad King. But then, Lord Commander Mormont's raven croaked King. The bird flapped across the solar to land on Mormont's shoulder. King, it said again, strutting back and forth. He likes that word, John said as he smiled. 
Mormont then stroked the raven under the beak with a finger, but all the while the raven's eyes never left Jon Snow. That's interesting because as soon as the Lord Commander Mormont said all the Dragon Kings are dead, the raven looked at Jon and said King. Then the raven said King again, and it never took its eyes off of Jon. And as we all know, Blood Raven is most likely controlling the ravens. The writer is discreetly telling us that not all of the Dragon Kings are dead, because Jon Snow is next in line. In another one of Jon's chapters, a very interesting story is told to him by Ygritte. After Jon captures Ygritte, she overhears that Jon is the bastard of Winterfell, and this reminds her of an old song. But Jon isn't too familiar with it, so Ygritte proceeds to tell Jon the story. In my opinion, this has a pretty clear connection to Rhaegar and Lyanna's story, but you be the judge. This is what she tells Jon. Bail the Bard made it, said Ygritte. He was king beyond the wall a long time back. All the free folk know his songs, but might be you don't sing them in the south. The Stark in Winterfell wanted Bale's head, but never could take him, and the taste of failure galled him. One day in his bitterness, he called Bale a craven who prayed only on the weak. When word of that got back, Bale vowed to teach the Lord a lesson. So, he scaled the wall, he skipped down the King's Road, and walked into Winterfell one winter's night with harp in hand, naming himself Sigurik of Skagos. Sigurik means deceiver in the old tongue, that the first men spoke, and the giants still speak. North or south, singers always find a ready welcome, so Bale ate at Lord Stark's own table, and played for the Lord in his high seat until half the night was gone. He played and sang so well that when he was done, the Lord offered to let him name his own reward. All I ask is a flower, Bale answered, the fairest flower that blooms in the gardens of Winterfell. So the Stark sent to his glass gardens and commanded that the most beautiful winter roses be plucked for the singer's payment. And so it was done. But when morning come, the singer had vanished, and so had Lord Brandon's maiden daughter. Her bed they found empty, but for the pale blue rose that Bale had left on the pillow where her head had lain. John had never heard this tale before. Lord Brandon had no other children. For most a year they searched for any sign of Bale or this maid, till the Lord lost heart and took to his bed. And it seemed as though the line of Starks was at its end. But one night, as he lay waiting to die, Lord Brandon heard a child's cry. He followed the sound and found his daughter back in her bedchamber, asleep with a babe at her breast. They had been in Winterfell all the time, hiding with the dead beneath the castle. The maid loved Bale so dearly she bore him a son, the song says. Now let's look at the connections here. First we have a blue winter rose, just like the blue winter rose Rhaegar gave Lyanna. Then we have the young Stark daughter who goes missing, just like Lyanna went missing with Rhaegar. Then, the young Stark daughter has a child because she had fell in love with him, and she bore him a son, just like Lyanna did with Rhaegar. Now let me ask all of you this. Why do you think the first time this story is introduced in the books, it is being told to Jon Snow? I think you know the answer to that. What is very interesting is what Jon starts to do shortly after he has told this story. Jon begins to question who he really is. This story must have triggered something in Jon. He then tells Ygritte, I never meant to steal you. I never knew you were a girl until my knife was at your throat. If you kill a man and never meant, he's just as dead, Ygritte said stubbornly. Jon had never met anyone so stubborn, except maybe for his little sister Arya. Then Jon thinks to himself, is she still my sister, he wondered. Was she ever my sister? The answer is no, John. Arya is not your sister. John's identity crisis is really starting to intensify, but like I said at the beginning of the video, all of this stuff is subjective. I'm sure some people aren't going to look at this the same way I do, which is fine. I believe this next one is foreshadowing two different things. Next, we go to the last book of Dance with Dragons, and this one's in the prologue. This involved a character known as Veramir Sixkins, for those of you who don't know who he is, he is one of the wildlings from Mance's party. He is well known for being able to skin chain six different animals. He had wolves, shadow cats, and even a bear. He's basically the zookeeper beyond the wall. Anyways, he ends up getting stabbed and he's dying so he knows he needs to warg into something quick so he can continue to live through his conscience. 
As he's thinking about what to do, he starts to think about John and his dire wolf ghost. This is what he thinks. He had known what snow was the moment he saw that great white dire wolf stalking silent at his side. One skin changer can always sense another. Mance should have let me take the dire wolf. There would be a second life worthy of a king. He could have done it, he did not doubt. The gift was strong in snow, but the youth was untaught, still fighting his nature when he should have gloried in it. Okay, the key phrase here is, there would be a second life worthy of a king. Some of you might not know this, but Jon Snow is also a warg. In the books, he wargs into ghosts several times. He doesn't consciously do it like Bran does, but he does sense himself inside a ghost a few times. I think this quote is actually foreshadowing Jon's death and warging into ghost as he dies, but it's also foreshadowing that Jon is a king. Warging into ghost as you die would be worthy of a king, instead of just warging into any run-of-the-mill animal. And this is exactly what Jon's gonna do. Jon is stabbed multiple times at the end of this book, and he's about to die, but almost everyone believes he will warg into ghost. In fact, Melisandre has seen this in her flames. She has seen Jon, who was a man, then wolf, then man again. She even tried to warn Jon about his enemies sharpening their knives behind his back, but he wouldn't listen. But before Jon dies, he has a very interesting conversation with Maester Aemon. They had the same conversation in the show, but they did leave out a few small details, and there may be a reason why they left these things out. Maybe it's because it hinted at something they didn't want revealed yet, but you be the judge. Maester Aemon gives Jon one final piece of advice, and this is what he says. Egg had an innocence to him, a sweetness we all loved. Kill the boy within you, I told him the day I took ship for the wall. It takes a man to rule, an egg on, not an egg. Kill the boy and let the man be born. The old man felt John's face. You are half the age that egg was, and your own burden is a crueler one, I fear. You will have little joy of your command, but I think you have the strength in you to do the things that must be done. Kill the boy, John Snow. Winter is almost upon us. Kill the boy and let the man be born. Maester Aemon gave this speech twice, and both times it was to an Aegon. The first time he said this the same day he sailed to the wall. The second time he said this, it was the same day he sailed away from the wall. Very interesting, and it makes me wonder if Aemon knew who John truly was. I wonder if Aemon noticed something as he felt John's face. This may also be foreshadowing that John's real name will be Aegon in the books too. This next one could be some great wordplay too. In order to understand this possible clue, there is something you have to keep in mind. Other than Cersei's kids, the last two kings were Robert Baratheon and the Mad King. When those two kings are described, they are called a drunkard and a madman. Obviously, Robert is the drunk and the Mad King is the madman. Now let's look at these next few quotes to see the connection. Barristan Selmy could not dispute that. He had spent the best part of his own life obeying the commands of drunkards and madmen. That's referencing Selmy being a king's guard to Robert and the Mad King. Then, Tywin says to Jaime, You've served as a glorified bodyguard for two kings, one a madman and the other a drunk. He is talking about Robert and the Mad King. Now let's look at a quote describing something about Jon Snow. Jon laughed. Laughed like a drunk or a madman, and his men laughed with him. Now you could say that doesn't mean anything, or you could say that's a very clever way of George telling us that Jon is a king himself. Now let's take a look at something from A Clash of Kings. This is when Jon meets Gilly at Craster's Keep, and Gilly is looking for help. Her breath frosted the air in small nervous puffs. They say the king gives justice and protects the weak. She started to climb off the rock, awkwardly, but the ice had made it slippery and her foot went out from under her. John caught her before she could fall, and he helped her down safely. The woman knelt on the icy ground. Okay, so let's dissect this. Gilly said kings give justice and protect the weak. Then Gilly nearly falls and busts her ass, but John catches her and helps her safely down. John literally protected Gilly from falling. He protected the weak, like a king is supposed to. Then Gilly immediately kneels before him, as if he's a king. Maybe this is a clue that John really is a king, or maybe it's not. 
The last one I want to show you is pretty interesting, I think. The first part takes place in a Davos chapter. Davos is talking to Sir Axel Florent, and this is what he tells Davos. The Lady Melisandre tells us that sometimes R'hllor permits his faithful servants to glimpse the future in flames. It seemed to me as I watched the fire this morning that I was looking at a dozen beautiful dancers, maidens garbed in yellow silk, spinning and swirling before a great king. I think it was a true vision, sir. A glimpse of the glory that awaits his grace after we take King's Landing and the throne that is his by rights. Now remember what he saw. As he looked into the flames, he saw beautiful dancers in yellow spinning and swirling before a great king. Not just a king, but a great king. Now let's look at John's chapter later in the same book. John went to cut more branches, snapping each one in two before tossing it into the flames. The tree had been dead a long time, but it seemed to live again in the fire, as fiery dancers woke within each stick of wood to whirl and spin their glowing gowns of yellow, red, and orange. Sir Axel Florent did see this happening before a great king, and that great king is John Motherfunking Snow. In the fire, dancers dressed in yellow are spinning in front of John, which is exactly what R'hllor showed Sir Florent. Whether any of this is actual clues or not is up for debate, but when it happens so often, it's kind of hard to dismiss. I believe this just goes to show how George is a master at planting seeds and leaving a tiny bread trail that is very hard to notice during your first read-through. But if you trust the theory and then read the books again and consciously look for the signs, you can find them just like I did. I'm sure there are plenty more that I missed, and if you know any more, please let me know down in the comments. Anyways, what do you think about these quotes and how they were worded? Do you believe they are clues or hints about who John really is? Or do you think I'm looking too far into this? I am interested in hearing what you have to say. Thank you all so much for stopping by and watching the video. I really do appreciate that. And I also want to thank everyone on Patreon for continuing to support the channel. Have a great day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.